Welcome to the Femininja Project. I am your host, Cheryl I Love, middle aged ninja hiding in plain sight, dedicated to restoring human dignity one person at a time and helping you unleash your personal power. Discover that it's possible to look like a woman, act like a lady, move like a ninja, and think like a warrior. And remember, men are always welcome on the Femininja Project. I have several friends right now who are in their late 40s, and they are rapidly approaching the big 5-0. And a lot of them aren't very happy about it for some reason. A few of them I went to physical therapy school with, and they were, of course, much younger than me back then, and I guess they still are, but I really don't think that much about that kind of thing anymore. But they consistently made fun of me and teased me for being the old lady of the group. And yes, the old lady, because I was in my late 30s. And then they would also toss in that I was fat and out of shape as well, just for good measure. After all, what else are friends for? So now here they are rapidly approaching the big 5-0, banging their head against the table over it and bemoaning the fact that they're almost 50. Well, I know a little bit about being 50, but I am, just for old time's sake, really enjoying their discomfort and their angst about it. But I have got to tell you, as a deliriously happy woman over 50, that they really don't have to freak out. And neither do you. If you are approaching the big 5-0, embrace it. Because let me tell you something, 50 is fabulous. And there are many, many reasons why. And I also have the statistics to prove it. And I will share them with you in a few minutes. But 50 is actually when I really found my power. It's when I really felt comfortable in my own skin and that things were really finally starting to go right for me. I have to admit that my 30s were an absolute nightmare for me. And my 40s were even worse. And there was a time when I didn't even think I would make it to 50. And a lot of my friends didn't think so either. But the closer I got to the big 5-0, it was like, well, maybe I could make it. It was almost like I was doing a marathon or I was crawling on my belly and I could just see the finish line. And if I could only get to 50, maybe something will change because things had been so rough (laughs) for the previous 20 years. And I mean, that's really kind of harsh for me to say that. There were definitely really positive and happy times, of course, but there were some really big hard hits that I took in my 30s and my 40s. So the closer I did get to 50, and one of the things I was looking forward to, and you might not believe this, was menopause, because I was really looking forward to that. I was willing to take the hot flashes, because what I was dealing with really wasn't much fun, and I figured the hot flashes would be a pleasant diversion. So the closer I did get to 50, and I was really looking at myself, as, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a 50-year-old woman that I heard about the Red Hat Society, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it, where um, it's a group of women, 50 and older, the once they turn 50, they get to join the Red Hat Society, and every now and again, they all dress up in red hats and purple dresses and look ridiculous and go out to lunch or different other activities. And I thought, in some respects, that was a really cute idea, but in other respects, it was like, I didn't want a hat. I wanted a frickin' tiara because I earned it and I deserved it. So I would share that story with my friends in ballet class, especially those were the people that I hung around with on a regular basis because I was taking ballet class almost every day. So you see the same group of people, and a lot of us had been friends for 20 years at least, so we knew each other's history, we had celebrated each other's accomplishments, and we held each other's hands during the rough times and stuff. And let me tell you, if you really want to get into the dregs of society and really listen to women and pour their hearts out, uh, go into a dressing room in a ballet studio because there are, there is no filter. Everything is fair game. So I had told my girlfriends just laughingly and jokingly that I wanted a red tiara for my 50th birthday. And you really know who your friends are because these women were so amazing. They actually organized a party for me to celebrate my 50th birthday and it included a crowning ceremony where they would crown me with a red tiara. So one of my girlfriends who was a lot more computer savvy than the rest of us were in those days, was a few years ago, won't tell you exactly 
exactly how many, but you might be able to figure it out eventually. But anyway, she got on, went online and she found red tiaras for everybody who was already over the age of 50. So there were three of them and bought one for me as well. So they actually got a room down at a restaurant in downtown Denver called Dixon's. And they uh, rented the party room or the banquet room. And we were going to celebrate my 50th birthday there. It was just absolutely fabulous. The pictures are great. We had such a wonderful time. And I was actually deep, of course, into my martial arts training at the time as well. And these same women who were so upset and worried when I began my martial arts training because they were so afraid I was going to get hurt physically, mentally, emotionally, etc., pretty much in every way, were so excited because I was climbing up the ranks of the dojo. I was now a blue belt and I was preparing for my next level, which was my second degree blue belt, which signified the halfway mark to the black belt in my martial arts dojo. And very few women, very few had ever gotten that high in in ranking in that school. So they were so darn excited about it that two of the women actually bought a doll. It's a little music box and it has a ballerina on top. And what they did, the ballerina had very long blonde hair, which I used to, by the way, I was a blonde for many years. One of these days, I'll probably have to post some of those pictures because people just don't believe that I was a blonde. But yes, I was for many years. But anyhow, they cut the hair of the doll to about shoulder length or right above shoulder length, which is how long my hair was back then. And they colored it red. So it looked like me. And they even painted her fingernails red because I was wearing a nail color back then called pants on fire. And it was just really hilarious. These girls went all out. And then instead of having a tutu on this little ballerina, they had actually made her a miniature gi. It was white, which, you know, our gis are black, but it didn't matter. It was a gorgeous little gi, and they made a belt that was a blue belt with a black stripe, and it was so adorable. Oh, and she actually even had a little red tiara on. I don't know where they found some of this stuff, but they said they had a great time going shopping and just looking for these little things until they made their little Cheryl doll, and it was so cute. I still have that thing today. It's right here down with me in my girl cave. So anyhow, it's just a wonderful memory, too, of, you know, what a great time we had. And not only that, it was just a wonderful memory for me and a reminder that people will go out of their way for you and that I really did have friends who were loving and caring and really cared a lot about me. And, you know, they cared so much about me as we were partying and having fun and just enjoying each other's company and all this stuff. And it was right before we had the official crowning ceremony, the door just burst open of the banquet room and a bunch of firemen came walking in and we all looked at each other and I mean my eyes got really big and I thought wow my friends really did go all out for this party and you know I really didn't think this was my thing but obviously that they I figured they had hired these gentlemen as our entertainment and again like I said not my thing but wow they really did go all out and as I was looking around the group of women to see who in the world did this they were all looking at each other wondering who had hired these firemen and as we're just kind of waiting for the entertainment they're looking at us and saying ladies didn't you hear the alarm it's time to vacate there is a fire alarm I thought we all thought that they were just some male entertainment and actually they really were firemen so we pretty much had everything it was a wonderful time and a a great time was had by all and I had decided too as I was turning 50 that in addition to the birthday party and the red tiara that I was going to receive that I was going to celebrate 50 days of Cheryl. So I highly recommend that too, is when you do turn 50, just say every single day for 50 days that you're going to do something special for yourself or recognize yourself, celebrate yourself in some special way. It doesn't have to be anything big, but some conscious effort to set aside a few minutes and say, I am celebrating myself on this, you know, first day or second day or or even 12th day of you, whatever, just to celebrate yourself and honor yourself in some way. And that just really kicks off the big five O in a really positive way. So I do have to tell you that on the 10th day of Cheryl, I got a really bad stomach flu. So I said to myself, I said, self, it's okay. I'm just going to ignore this one day, take this off of the calendar, and I'll pick up the 10th day of Cheryl starting again tomorrow. Well, it took me almost a week to get rid of that stomach flu. So the 50 days of Cheryl just kind of went, you know, down the toilet pretty, pretty much literally. And I just picked it up the following year and decided to do 51 days of Cheryl. So that's kind of how I celebrate my birthday 
each and every year. It's just maybe I consciously don't do something, but it's just kind of a nice reminder of how special you really are. And I do have to tell you that my 50s were the best decade of my life. I, my 50s were amazing. And yes, bad stuff happened, but I just felt like I was stepping into my own power. I was comfortable in my own skin. I really knew what I wanted out of life and I knew how to get it or at least how to go about it in, in some way. And, you know, yes, a lot of really bad stuff happened during my 50s as well. Both my parents died when I was 54 and they were ill basically at the same time. That's kind of how my family does things. Let's just get it done. And the entire year of 2010, I spent half of the year back in western Pennsylvania. So somebody who is self-employed, it was really, uh, you know, very difficult, but I was just so happy that I was able to do it. So I did end up losing both my mom and my dad just 19 days apart in November of 2010. I came very close to losing my business because I had taken so much time off. But like I said, I was so happy that I was able to do that for them, to spend the time with them and to help them. But, uh, you know, I was still like, yeah, getting kicked around a little bit, but I still felt very content with my life. And that was just really amazing. So it actually prompted me to research the topic to see if I was just making this up, if I was fooling myself that I was so deliriously happy, or is this a phenomenon? phenomenon of nature, or maybe is it just a modern myth that's fabricated by the delusion of those of us over 50 that, yes, we are happier over 50, or, you know, just how people really did feel after turning 50. And what I found was truly amazing. I discovered that 92% of women over 50 say that they are happier than they have ever been in their entire life. 81% of women over 50 feel as sexy as they did in their 20s. I have to say I feel a little bit sexier than I did back then because I started pole dancing at the age of 58. And if you want to feel sexy, you put on a pair of booty shorts and hooker shoes and hang out with women who are in their 20s in a pole class, and you do feel pretty darn sexy as long as you don't look in the mirror. But I will tell you that pole dancing does get a bad rap, and it's not what people think it is. It's really an incredible form of fitness and it is incredibly difficult it's a lot of work the women that do it are absolutely lovely and we have such a good time and nothing quite levels the playing field like pole dancing because it is brutally difficult it is the hardest thing I have ever done in my entire life and I have done a lot of difficult things and a lot of crazy ones as well but you know you might want to put that on your list when you turn 50 start pole dancing. Your husband will love you for it. So anyway, only 24% of women over 50 worried about looking old. And a whopping 70% said that they would turn down plastic surgery if it was offered to them for free. And that really surprised me, but it just delighted me as well. Because I thought that was really an excellent indication that women really do feel comfortable in their own skin or more comfortable in their own skin when they are 50 and older. Older. And I applaud that decision and I heartily agree with those women because as a card carrying ninja, uh, there is no way I would allow anybody with a sharp object coming near my face anywhere near it. I don't really care. There's not enough anesthesia in the world. I would know that they were coming after me with that knife. And I don't know what I would do about it because I'd be anesthetized, but I would figure out a way to rip it out of their cold, dead hands. So anyway, I can see that there really isn't any plastic surgery in my future. However, I am very open to some of the non-surgical techniques uh, out there that are available. So if you do know of any that are relatively painless, uh, affordable, and non-invasive, non-intrusive, please do let me know. Another statistic that I thought was really interesting is that 51% of women really don't give a rip what the younger generation thinks about them. And I think that's absolutely fantastic because I learned at a very young age, and I'm talking when I was in high school, that life is not an ongoing popularity contest and that the less concerned I was about what other people thought about me, the more I liked myself and the less concerned I was about trying to please other people and make sure that they liked me because let's face it, not everybody is going to like us and that's just fine. We don't want them to anyway, right? 
I'll never forget one time in ballet class, probably over 15 or maybe even 20 years ago. It was quite a long time ago. And some of the women my age were talking about how there they were, all of these old women in this ballet class with a lot of the younger women and the younger girls. And what must they think about them, seeing them there with their wrinkles and all that stuff that they were so darn old. And I just wanted to smack them upside the head and say, stop talking like that. You're really not that old. Old, but it wasn't my place. And they went on and on. And then finally, one of the women said, you know, I'll bet they really like it. I think they probably really like it. I think they probably think it's cool that we're in class with them. And I turned around. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, really, honestly, who cares what they think? They're lovely people, but what they think about us really doesn't matter and isn't important. It's what we think about ourselves that really count and really matter. Although it is interesting to note that those same women, here it is all these years later, are still concerned and worried about what other people think about them. So I think they really don't understand that letting go of certain things and letting go of that self-judgment and looking for approval from outside ourselves is something that we just really don't need as we get to be a certain age. Age. And I dug into this a little bit more deeply about two years ago when I was spending some time with one of my younger friends that I hadn't seen in a while. And we were spending quite a bit of time together. And I was really surprised at how angry she seemed. And she just seemed so unhappy. She was in you know, between her mid to late 40s, probably closer to mid 40s. And everything that came out of her mouth was just so negative and so judgmental. And everybody around her was just horrible, according to her. Um, uh, everybody that she worked with and she just ripped into them and went on this tirade about how she hated everybody that she worked with and I could kind of understand maybe she was in a bad situation and then every one of her in-laws she just couldn't stand them they had had several falling outs and she just couldn't find it in her heart to forgive them because whatever they had done to her was so terrible although she couldn't really be very specific of what it was and uh, on and on and on uh, friends of hers that she had been friends with for a while and things that they had done and she just couldn't couldn't wrap her head around it and she was just so judgmental and everything was just oh unbearable she was almost insufferable to be around and then she started in on her children and her children are really beautiful kids they're wonderful they're so good they're smart and finally I looked at her and I said tell me something good tell me something in your life that you're really happy about and something that makes you happy or something that's going well and that was really not the thing to say because then she turned all of that anger toward me and it wasn't pretty and I just kind of let her rant and let her rave and I gracefully removed myself from the situation as soon as I could I made like a ninja and disappeared and I would like to check back with her that's been two years and I would like to check back and see how she's feeling about herself now or how her life is going but honestly I don't want to open up that can of worms and I'm just keeping my distance because I think that's the safest thing to do and the smartest thing to do but it was after I shared that story with a another woman that I've become friends with in a different ballet class and she was nodding her head and listening and finally she said how old of a person did you say she was and I told her and she said ah that fits right in with the happiness curve and I asked her what that was and she told me about a book and the author's name is Jonathan Roche or Rauch uh, it's R-A-U-C-H. And the name of the book, the title is The Happiness Curve, Why Life Gets Better After 50. She explained that scientific research reveals that older people do feel less stress and regret. They are generally and genuinely happier. They dwell less on negative information. They are better able to regulate their emotions and control them. Or do they feel the pressure to achieve status? They don't feel that status is as important as it was when they were younger. My friend explained to me that the happiness curve is like the shape of a great big U and that when people are younger, when they're children, that they are at their happiest because my goodness, we really, really didn't have that much responsibility and there was usually somebody taking care of all of our needs. But as we got older, our happiness actually declined. And when we got into our 20s, we're trying to figure out our lives, you know, what our careers are going to be, trying to figure out who we are and how to make our way in the world. And then in our 30s, we're really establishing our careers, maybe starting families. And then when we're in our 40s, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm halfway to death, or my life is half over. And where do I go from here? And at that point in our lives, we're actually on the downhill slide of that U-curve. And that's when we're at the most unhappy. And then 
then it kind of flattens out when we're in our 40s trying to think, is this all there is? And, you know, you've worked so hard and you just have this generalized feeling of dissatisfaction and not even knowing what the problem is. And people used to call it a midlife crisis. I don't know if they still do, but it really isn't a crisis. It's just a sense of general dissatisfaction. And according to Jonathan Roche, if I hope I'm saying his name correctly, that he fell into the doldrums in his 40s for absolutely no apparent reason because everything was going great in his life. He had a great career. He had a great relationship. He had good health. He had secure and stable finances and everything was going along just fine. But he had this nagging and, and persistent feeling of discontent and that something in his life really wasn't working when everything really was. And that's when he just happened to hear about the happiness curve and it made absolute sense to him. And as far as he's concerned, he thinks that we should forget about saying that life begins at 40. It's 50 that we should be looking toward as that's, you know, life beginning at 50. I'm here to tell you, I'm going to disagree with that. And I'm going to take it a step further. I think that life really begins at 60. Because, you know, my 50s were so darn good that when it came time for me to turn 60, I wasn't worried about it. As a matter of fact, I ran toward 60 with my arms outstretched open wide and just embracing it because I figured if my 50s were as good as they were, that we were just on an uphill spiral and it was going to get better and better and better. And so far, I've been right. I'm only, well, I'm not that far into 60, but it's just been fabulous so far. So if 50 is fabulous, I'm thinking that 60 is sensational. Anyway, this information and this enlightenment just made such an impact on this author, Jonathan Rauch, that he was so relieved to have an explanation for the gloom that had hit him, and he believes that it hits a lot of others in mid-age, and he actually became almost evangelical about spreading the word about the happiness curve and what to expect and why things do happen that way, that you hit this, this trough, that you hit, I don't want to say rock bottom because that sounds far too dramatic and it really isn't that bad, but it is that generalized feeling of discontent, thinking that something is wrong, or maybe they need to start buying some fancy cars or some expensive jewelry or other things, an external source to make them feel better. And I think that's where that uh, little cliche of the midlife crisis came in, where, you know, either women would go crazy and start getting facelifts or expensive clothing or jewelry, and men would all of a sudden start buying some fancy cars. It's a way of looking for an outside source for happy or for something to make yourself feel better or feel like you're, you've are you achieved something. And that's where that cliche of the midlife crisis comes in. But when we know that this is almost like a natural part of life's process and life's journey, we probably would be able to handle it a little bit better and maybe have some other sources, other resources that we could rely on, or even just be open and honest about it with people that we trust and we're close to that won't judge us and maybe we can talk it through. And you might even find out that they're experiencing the same thing as well. So it's always a really good idea to communicate with other people, at least if the, you know that there is somebody who is not going to just pass judgment on you or tell you that you've absolutely lost your mind. I've learned the hard way. You just don't want to do that. You have to choose your confidants very carefully. The happiness curve is supported by recent findings in psychology, brain science, that's one of my favorites, you know that, and economics, which really do confirm a surprise that contrary to the belief Belief that late adulthood is a time of relinquishment, sadness, decline, and loneliness, that it actually tends to be the most satisfying time of life. And the only time that the aging process actually works against us as far as happiness is concerned is through midlife. And that time in midlife might not necessarily be a crisis, but it is that experience of dissatisfaction, restlessness, maybe even disappointment, and not because there's anything wrong with their life or something that's going on, but it's that emotional reboot that is going on inside of us as our values, our expectations, and even our brains, our neuroplasticity, is changing and shifting our goals and our desires away from um, our jobs, uh, achieving status, achieving excellence in work, and toward building connections and community that really increases our contentment and benefits those people around us as well. So in my mind, it's almost like a time of 
of renewed uh, personal awareness, individual awareness, as well as personal, emotional, and even spiritual growth and awareness. So it actually even helps us stay positive and optimistic even through the remainder of our lives all the way in through our 80s, 90s, and dare I say, even our 100s. Life is what we make it in every single stage of life, but it is kind of nice to know ahead of time that this does happen to people and that happiness curve really is a, a real thing and it's something to keep in mind if it does happen to you. But the good news is the big five O is right around the corner and 50 is absolutely fabulous. So I'd like to give you a few tips that you can plan ahead so you can enjoy your 50s as much as possible. It's just like planning for retirement. You're going to be planning for the big Big five O and beyond, and it's going to be wonderful. First of all, keep a positive attitude. I always say what we believe is what we become, and what we tell ourselves and what we hear from other people is what we eventually do believe. So don't pay any attention to the naysayers. Don't pay any attention to the media or other people who are going to try and tell you that it's all downhill from here because they're lying and they don't know. And maybe if they are over 50 and it is all downhill for them, maybe that's because they didn't plan very well. Well, so give yourself positive messages. The other thing to remember is to keep moving. If you can keep moving, it is so good for your health. It's not only good for your physical health, it's also good for your mental, your cognitive status. We have got to simply keep moving. So one of the biggest mistakes that people will make is that in their 40s, they start to, they're focusing so much on other things, raising family, their jobs, whatever, or maybe going through toward the bottom of that U curve that they forget that they need to keep themselves fit and healthy. And I don't mean by lifting weights or going to the gym all the time. You don't have to do that, but to keep moving and keep yourself moving. So that's one of the things that's really going to help keep you going for the rest of your life. You're investing in your health when you do that. And as far as investing in your health, look into other things as far as, you know, dietary changes that you can make. Uh, Look into other alternative health practices that you might be able to engage in, something like either yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, Feldenkrais is another one. I mentioned that in one of my previous episodes. There are so many things out there that you can do to start investing in your health now so you don't have to pay for the neglect down the road. So take care of yourself and listen to your body. That's really important. The other thing is to keep your friendships going and make new friends. Join the different community centers, get active in your community, any place where you can meet a variety of new and interesting and different people. And I really believe that we need to extend our friendships and our relationships beyond generational lines. So you don't want to always be hanging out with people of your same age group, that I think it's really important to go to the generation beyond you and to the generations underneath you. Have friends of every single age group, because that's another thing that really stimulates our thought processes. And the way we communicate the different generations are far different. And so we have to adjust our communication style so we can have rich and fulfilling relationships. And while we're talking about friendships, you might have to be very, very attentive to the quality of your relationships, because if they start to go bad, there are people that you might have to just kind of give them the heave ho and take them out of your life if they're not contributing to it in a positive way. I always think back of my friend, Mary Pat, the one that I had to break up with after 30 years. She was my best friend forever. That was in episode five. And I get down on my knees almost every single day and thank God that I had the wisdom to be able to break up with her because at this point in my life, if I had her hanging on around my neck, I couldn't imagine. It would be such an energy suck and a happiness drain and would just uh, suck the life out of me. So you might want to be very, very vigilant about your friendships and If you have to let somebody go, you have to let them go. And if you are thinking about retirement, and some of us are and some of us aren't, some of us want to work forever because we absolutely love what we do. But if you are thinking about retirement, don't think of that as the end game. That's not the end of the journey. That's just the start of something new. It's an opportunity to explore new things, do some volunteering, maybe work at a different type of job part time, something that you've always wanted to do, maybe in a bookstore, a yarn shop, or a wine shop. That would be really kind of fun too. 
something different, but you can still stay actively engaged in the community and you're just getting out, meeting new people and learning new things. That's another thing. That's the final thing I'm going to say is lifelong learning is the key. Some of the most amazing people I know are over the age of 70 and even 80. And they are so youthful, healthy, and vibrant because they are constantly learning new things. They stay curious, they stay interested in their environment, in their community, in everything that's going on on around them, they stay engaged. And that's really, really important. Not only is it good for your mental health, but it's really good for your cognitive health and it's good for your emotional and spiritual health as well. So those are just some of my thoughts and some of the reasons why I think that 50 is fabulous. And I'm here to tell you that 60 is sensational as well. And please don't fear the 5-0. It's one of the best things that can happen to you. So thank you so much for listening. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Femininja Project. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be safe, be strong. And until next time, bye now.